I would like to welcome all those who will be viewing the second lecture of hematology. The first lecture is available at our YouTube page at paboardreview.org. My name is Wesley Norwood and am part of Joe Gilboy's paboardreview.org team. We pride ourselves in providing evidence-based learning. This will be the second in a four-part series covering hematology for the PAN slash PAN Ray certification examination. I would like to make these quick and valuable as time is a limiting factor for most of us. In lecture two, this lecture, we will review the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway of blood clotting and the lab tests that are associated with hematology. In lecture three, we'll go over the pathophysiology, i.e. the disease states, autoimmunity, those things that will most likely be encountered on the pans pan array examination. In lecture four, we will review the leukemias. To quickly go over what we reviewed in lecture one, we talked about the liver consistently providing inactivated factors for the clotting cascade, the platelets, and the number of red blood cells circulating in our bloodstream. The endothelial lining, the vessels are a single layer of epithelial cells. They are generally flat, round, and smooth. They are very resistant to friction, like Teflon. They are very biologically active, both, both in preventing and propagating the clotting cascade. Some of the things we mentioned, and I don't think this is important to memorize these, but to know they exist, some of the agents that they secrete in order to inhibit the clotting when unnecessary are nitric oxide, prostaglandins, ADP, plasmin, which breaks down fibrin, thrombomodulin, protein C, heparin sulfate, and I think it's important to talk about blood flow and them baiting ourselves with nutrients and disposing of waste, but it also decreases the chances of these factors from bumping into each other and clotting. And then we talked about the tissues that are surrounding the vasculature system, depending on where we are in the body. We know that the vasculature contains certain components like elastic tissue, which are most prevalent in the arteries and arterioles, connective tissue, smooth muscle, which are very prevalent in the veins and venules, and also muscle tissues. When we talk about co coagulation cascade, we want to first talk about the intrinsic pathway and what initiates that pathway. First, an insult is incurred exposing the subendothelial tissue, most likely connective tissue. And when that happens, the surrounding endothelial cells release chemicals to cause vasoconstriction. This does two things. It causes hemostasis and it also increases the chances of these clotting factors from bumping into each other and activating. So, when the endothelial tissue is exposed, the surrounding tissue releases what's called von Wildebrand's factor. It's a sticky material that attaches to the connective tissue. What th this does is it has special hooks that will allow it to catch and hold on to inactivated platelets. And these will adhere to the von Wildebrand's factor. What's the most common hereditary bleeding disorder? It's von Wildebrand's disease. So there's three types depending on how much your body produces. And you can see the problem this would cause as we are exposed to thousands of micro trauma, micro thrombi a day in order for a body to maintain our vascular system. What happens in the intrinsic pathway is the PTT is prolonged. And if you our testing for von Wildebrand's disease, the PTT, will be prolonged. After this first layer, this primary platelet plug is formed, 
these platelets will release granules of different substances. And these substances are serotonin, ADP, adenosine diphosphate, which causes platelets to become active. Also, what are released are calcium ions. As you remember, aspirin and like drugs inactivate platelets. This will prolong the bleeding time, not the PTT or the PC, but the bleeding time. As we said before, there are a number of inactivated clotting factors circulating in our bloodstream. To kind of quickly review those, I don't think they're really important to remember the exact factors only when pertaining to certain hereditary diseases, but to go over them really quickly, 12 becomes activated when it comes in contact with this platelet plug. 11 becomes activated, which activates 9. Now, I think the critical thing to remember is that 10 prothrombin thrombin, and we're going to go over to fibrin and fibrinogen in the next slide, 10 thrombin, they're the common pathways in both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway. In order for those to be able to be activated, we must have platelets, we must have calcium, and we must have factor 8. Okay? So when we talk about the intrinsic pathway, those pharmacological drugs that can affect it, as Joe says, are those that are taken IV or sub-Q, intrinsic IV sub-Q, like heparin, streptokinase, or urokinase. So after the primary platelet plug is formed, it must be strengthened. So thrombin activates fibrinogen into fibrin. Fibrin is the activated form which creates cross-links over the platelets, forming a secondary platelet plug, strengthening that. Now remember, red blood cells, platelets, white blood cells that are circulating around also stick to this. Bacteria can stick to this. Other things can stick to this and get caught up in it. Now when we talk about hemophilia A, what does that mean? Well, we have abnormal bleeding because our body's not producing factor VIII. It's an intrinsic problem. So again, like von Wildebrand's disease, the PTT will be prolonged. And the treatment is cryoprecipitate factor VIII. So what you do is you take blood that has been donated and you get factor VIII out. And that's what you give the patient because that's what they're lacking. And then they're able to complete the intrinsic coagulation cascade. So kind of in review, the primary hemostatic plug is produced when von Wildebrand factor lines expose site, platelets stick to it, they adhere to it. It's not only it's not until the fibrin strands are added to increase strength that we create a secondary platelet plug. So here's kind of the overview and in intrinsic clotting cascade. So some of the problems that can occur during this process are one, if the secondary platelet plug becomes too big, it gets ripped off and, and it goes into the cardiovascular system, it can create a thrombus. A clot is a thrombus outside of the cardiovascular system. A moving thrombus is called an embolus. So a thromboembolus would be a moving clot. Okay, let's talk about the extrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway is initiated when there's any tissue damage. The tissue releases what's called tissue factor, or TF for short. This activates factor 7, which both goes to 9 and 10. Remember, we said 10 thrombi, thrombus, or thrombin, and fibrinogen are common in both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway. So when we talk about the extrinsic pathway, we talk about the PT. Joe associates this with the PO, anything you could take by mouth. Remember, aspirin's excluded, but when we talk about PO, we talk about commonly Coumadin or Warfarin. Then we talk about 
the vitamin K dependent factors. And an easy way to remember those are SNOT. 7, 9, the O stands for number 10, and T for 2. 2 is also another name for, for prothrombin. So when somebody is vitamin K de deficient, they're not able to form these factors efficiently. So you can see what problems would occur. So these factors are dependent on vitamin K in order for them to be formed properly in the liver. This both affects the PT and PTT because you can kind of see that 7, which is the extrinsic factor, and then the common pathways for the intrinsic factor are affected. Warfarin, its mechanism of action is inhibiting vitamin K-dependent coagulation. What is the treatment for a warfarin overdose? It's vitamin K so that your liver can produce these factors. So, to kind of go over some of the lab results that we talked about, PT, it's PO, anything taken by mouth, like humidity and warfarin, things that can affect it or liver disease, vitamin K deficiency, or alcohol use, which affects liver disease. PTT is commonly associated with the intrinsic pathway. It can be affected by inherited factors such as von Wildermann's disease, hemophilia A, which affects factor 8, heparin, anything given sub-Q or IV. Bleeding time is affected by aspirin and it measures the platelet function. INR which is the range, should be in the range of two or three. Just remember there's two or three letters in INR. It's also used to monitor warfarin or Coumadin. Okay, let's review some of the tests that are associated with hematology. So the direct Coombs tests, what happens is we're testing the antibodies that are attached to the red blood cells. So what happens first is a sample of blood is taken and red blood cells are washed with anti-human antibodies, or the, it's another name for it is a Coombs reagent, and this is also used in the indirect Coombs test, cause these red blood cells to clot. They cause them to clump together, and if you look in a test tube, they'll clump together. And if you've ever heard of a cold agglutination test, this is kind of the same concept as that the red blood cells will clump together. Coombs reagent are linking the red blood cells together. Now with the indirect Coombs test, the recipient's serum is obtained, so the red blood cells are taken out, and the donor's blood is added. If the recipient's serum has antibodies that are specific for those red blood cells, then they will attach to the red blood cells. The same Coombs reagent is added, and if these antibodies are present, again, they'll clump together. But in the direct and indirect Coombs test, we're looking at specific red blood cells versus antibodies that are present in the patient's serum. Are they going to react? So to review some of the components that are measured, red blood cells, of course, vitamin B12 and folic acid, which are important in the construction of these, the cells. Hemoglobin, which determines the carrying capacity of red blood cells. Think of them as the train car capacity to carry oxygen and to get rid of carbon dioxide. The heart is responsible for determining the rate of blood flow. Cardiac output equals stroke volume times stroke rate. The st stomach's important in secreting intrinsic factor which absorbs vitamin B12. The liver functions control the factors. If that's not functioning correctly, then we're not going to be able to clot correctly. Our kidneys respond to a decrease in oxygen by creating erythropoietin, which increases the number of reticular sites, which can be viewed on a blood smear by a special stain. Bone marrow is the area where these cells are produced. 
flat bones in adults, all bones in kids. The spleen, its primary job is a lymphocyte, but the secondary, the secondary job is to recycle red blood cells. And remember, if we spin down blood, the heavier cells in a centrifuge will precipitate toward the bottom. The red blood cells at the bottom, a thin layer of white blood cells above that. There should be a ratio of 55% plasma versus 45% formed elements. We talked about in our last lecture, thinking of the red blood cells, folic acid, and hemoglobin as train cars. If you look at a blood smear, you're expected to see a ratio of 1,000 red blood cells per white blood cell. If you're asking for a differential on a complete blood count, you're looking at lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils, granulocytes versus agranulocytes. We'll talk a little bit more about that. On that same blood smear, you're expected to see about 20 red blood cells per platelet. The inactivated form um, is different from the activated in that you don't see those little hooks that are, are forming. And the difference between a mature red blood cell and a reticulocyte is that if you stain the red blood cells with a certain stain, you'll be able to see remnants of RNA. And we'll be talking further about the importance of each of these in determining the pathophysiology of certain disease states. So the next lecture, lecture three, we'll cover the pathophysiology to disease states, autoimmunities, those things most likely encountered on the pants or pen ray recertification examination. In lecture four, we will review the leukemias. I'd like to thank Joe and all the time and effort he's put into preparing the material for these reviews. I'm looking forward to any feedback or comments you have, you can send a email to me at wes at paboardreview.org. Please join our PA Board Review community at paboardreview.org.